This is Introduction to Genitourinary Radiology, Part 3. I'm Dr. Dan Koval. So for this final segment, I'll give you a brief overview of CT urography. We'll discuss bladder and urethral diverticula, and then we'll review basic scrotal pathology. So let's start with CT urography. Now, the most important phase of the CT urogram is the excretory phase, and that's when contrast opacifies the collecting system, ureters, and bladder, as in this case. And with this phase, we can identify any filling defects in the collecting system, ureters, and bladder, as well as detect um, neoplastic masses and areas of wall thickening. Note as well that the patient is in the prone position here. That can help uh, distend the ureters, but also gives you information about mobility of any filling defects you may discover. Also recall that the excretory phase begins at about three minutes after the time of injection and then starts to wane at 15 minutes. Now there are various post-processing techniques you can do with CT urography. One of those techniques is generating maximum intensity projection or MIP images with a thick slab reconstruction. And a MIP is a type of reformatting process that takes the voxels with the highest attenuation value on every view throughout a given volume and projects that onto a single image. So what that does is display high density structures like bone and contrast material filled structures preferentially. And everything that's less dense is not as well visualized. So in this case, you can see the right ureter containing excreted contrast, very conspicuous, as well as the bladder. You can also adjust the obliquity of these images, as in this case, to highlight a particular structure. Another technique is to generate 3D volume rendered images, as in this case, this is a surface rendering of the collecting system ureters and bladder showing a normal patient. Um, and this is a great way to further characterize complex geo anomalies like congenital anomalies. Looking at a case, you can see that the left ureter is dilated and contains excreted contrast as well as a dependent filling defect. This patient was scanned in the prone position. You can see the table there. Moving inferiorly down the ureter, you can see that there are additional filling defects and also that the ureter is focally dilated at this level. And the excretory phase is excellent at identifying tumors such as transitional cell carcinoma and other filling defects involving the renal pelvis, ureters, and bladder. This was a patient with multifocal ureteral transitional cell carcinoma. Note also how the ureter is focally dilated at the level of the masses here. That's classic for TCC and known as the goblet sign or chalice sign, where the ureter accommodates the slow growth of the tumor. This is a different case showing excreted contrast within the urinary bladder. The contrast is very homogeneous throughout the bladder because the patient either walked around or was rolled before the scan in order to mix the excreted contrast in the bladder with the unopacified urine. And you can see, again, the patient's in the prone position, but uh, there's also a polypoid intraluminal mass at the right ureteral vesicular junction. And then looking at the right kidney, you can see that there is associated right hydronephrosis and dilatation of the visualized proximal ureter. So the CT urography is also excellent at detecting bladder wall thickening in any polypoid intraluminal masses, not only on the excretory phase, but on additional phases I'll discuss on a separate lecture series. And this patient did have a transurethral bladder tumor resection yielding muscle invasive papillary transitional cell carcinoma. CT urography is also excellent at detecting collecting system abnormalities. As in this case, this is a patient with bilateral coronal MIP images showing marked distortion of the calyces. And this is typical for papillary necrosis. And this was a patient who had papillary necrosis secondary to sickle cell disease. Just for comparison, here's a normal coronal MIP of a different kidney showing that normal calyx cell architecture. You can see the normal cupping of the minor calyx around the uh, medullary pyramid apex, as well as the normal fornices. Papillary necrosis is actually ischemic necrosis involving the tips of the medullary pyramids. Remember, the pyramidal apex is the papilla. And what happens is that as that becomes ischemic, part of the papilla may slough off into the collecting system and leaves a void that fills with contrast, and that distorts the chelicele architecture. And that has a variety of appearances that have been cleverly described, like lobster claw, ball in a T, signet ring. Uh, here's an example of ball in a T. But usually you just get an extensive distortion of the normal collecting system architecture. This is a different case of a patient with 
papillary necrosis involving a single pyramid. And you can see it has that ball on a T appearance again. It's upside down, but uh, it still applies. So the tip of the medullary pyramid has become ischemic and filled with contrast as it's left a void. And then on the coronal MIP image, you can see it again there. And then also on the 3D volume rendered reformat. This is a different case of a patient with multifocal uh, papillary necrosis. See the multifocal ball on a T appearance on this coronal MIP reformatted excretory phase image. And on the lower image, which is non-contrast, you can identify extensive renal parenchymal scarring, a finding that often coexists with severe papillary necrosis. So different causes of papillary necrosis, you may use this uh, mnemonic postcard to help you remember. Um, P would be pyelonephritis. O is obstruction, usually if it's chronic. S would be sickle cell disease, and that usually gives the most impressive uh, variants of papillary necrosis. Uh, T, it would be TB, tuberculosis, which will often give you uh, additional areas of amorphous calcification in the kidney, as well as asymmetric calyectasis due to infundibular stenosis. And then much less common causes would be cirrhosis, analgesic nephropathy, renal vein thrombosis, and diabetes mellitus. So if you just remember the post from postcard, I think you're in good shape. All right, looking at a different case here, this is an excretory phase coronal MIP reformat. And you can see the right kidney has a normal collecting system with a single ureter, but the left kidney has a duplicated collecting system and two ureters. When we have complete ureteral duplication, there's a rule that applies, and that's the Weigert-Meyer rule. So that rule states that with complete ureteral duplication, the ureter that drains the upper pole moiety passes through the bladder to insert medial and inferior to the ureter draining the lower pole. And you can remember that with this mnemonic dummy, D-U-M-I. And usually the upper pole moiety will end as an ectopic ureteral seal, as in this case you can see the upper pole moiety ends as this dilated region of the distal ureter. And that's been described as a cobra head or spring onion appearance. You can also remember that the upper pole moiety tends to obstruct, whereas the lower pole moiety tends to reflux. And you can also remember that vowels and consonants stay together there. So upper obstructs, lower refluxes. There is some overlap with that, but it's a general rule. And also, when the upper pole does obstruct, it can exert mass effect against the lower pole moiety and displace it. And that can cause the drooping lily sign. Now, that's more of a older intravenous pyelography sign because in that case with an IVP, you would only see excreted contrast within the displaced lower pole moiety, giving the drooping lily sign. On a CT urogram, though, even though the upper pole doesn't excrete contrast, you would still identify it on other sequences. All right, so that's a really quick overview of some of the things you can identify on CT urography. Now let's talk about bladder and urethral diverticula. The uppermost image here is a coronal MIP excretory phase reformatted image of the pelvis. You can see that here is the pubic symphysis as a landmark. And then you can also identify excreted contrast within the bladder, which communicates through this narrow mouth into a large diverticulum arising from the dome. And this lowermost image is a uh, surface uh, volume rendered 3D reformat, again showing that narrow neck leading into a large diverticulum. So bladder diverticula are typically acquired, uh, more common than congenital, and they're usually multiple and have a trabeculated wall. And we see them more commonly in patients who have uh, chronic bladder outlet obstruction, uh, typically older men with benign prostatic hypertrophy. One thing to know with bladder diverticula is if it has a narrow mouth, a narrow neck, it will tend to drain much more slowly into the bladder. And those diverticula are much more likely to have stasis and an increased risk of infection, and also stone formation and epithelial dysplasia and ultimately cancer. So here's an example of a patient on a retrograde urethrogram that had contrast filling the bladder and then also extending through this narrow neck into the diverticulum here. And then after voiding, the bladder emptied, but then you can see this is all contrast still within the uh, diverticulum. So that would be one with a narrow neck showing stasis. Now we're looking at a sagittal T2 weighted image of the pelvis. And you know it's T2 weighted because the bladder is bright and simple fluid, water, urine will be bright on T2. Some additional anatomy. Here is the pubic symphysis anteriorly. Then there's the urethra. There's the vagina. And then the rectum and anal canal. And then note anterior and posterior to the urethra, we have this T2 bright lobulated 
structure, which when you look at the axial T2-weighted images becomes more apparent. It has a yin-yang shape, and that's a urethral diverticulum. The urethra is actually right here, immediately posterior to the pubic symphysis, and you should always get into the habit of looking um, for the urethra on any cross-sectional imaging study through the pubic symphysis, because you may incidentally detect a urethral diverticulum, especially if a patient has a history of recurrent pyelonephritis, because these patients often have recurrent UTIs, post-void dribbling, and other symptoms. And we also have an image here of a post gadolinium T1-weighted fat-suppressed evaluation showing that there's no abnormal enhancement within the diverticulum because there is a slight increased risk of malignancy. So MRI is an excellent tool for detecting urethral diverticula and characterizing. Now, VCUG, or vesicourethrography, is also an excellent tool to detect urethral diverticula. This is the initial image showing the bladder connecting to the urethra, and then we have this dilated collection there. And after the patient voided, there's still pooling of contrast within that urethral diverticulum. And you can see that's why you would have increased stasis leading to infection. So if a diverticulum is not detected or fully characterized on VCUG, that's when MRI would be the um, next best modality. So the final section we'll talk about is the scrotum. Now we're looking at a ultrasound of the scrotum. Here is the normal testis. But then you also notice there is this uh, dilated tubular structure that's been isolated for measurement, and that measures about 6 millimeters. And that's uh, pretty classic for a varicocele. So the definition for varicocele is somewhat variable depending on the source you review, but uh, generally a peritesticular vein that measures 3 millimeters or more is consistent with a varicocele. And they form as a result of incompetent valves in the gonadal veins, the testicular veins. And most of them are left-sided, 85%. And that's because the testicular vein drains into the left renal vein at a 90-degree angle. And then the SMA compresses that left renal vein, and that causes increased back pressure uh, into the gonadal vein, the testicular vein. So if those are large, they can cause infertility and pain. Now, there are certain maneuvers that should be done when evaluating a varicocele. You can see in this uppermost color Doppler image, uh, we see no significant flow about the varicocele. However, when we have the patient bared down or valsalva, uh, we see marked flow within the varicocele and increased diameter to 5 millimeters. So valsalva-induced flow augmentation should be done when the patient is supine or upright, and you'll see increased flow, ideally reversal of flow. Now, if it's isolated to the right side, as in this case, which is a right varicocele, that raises suspicion for an underlying retroperitoneal mass or lymphadenopathy compressing that right gonadal vein because the right uh, gonadal vein enters the IVC obliquely uh, at a less than 90 degree angle and isn't really prone to uh, physiologic vascular compression. So those patients need to be further evaluated with either ultrasound or CT. This patient went on to have a CT scan of the abdomen showing retroperitoneal conglomerate lymphadenopathy in the expected region of where the right gonadal vein would drain obliquely into the inferior vena cava, causing that compression. And this was metastatic retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy from prostate cancer. So whenever you have an isolated right varicocele, definitely continue the workup. This is a different case, uh, a transverse image showing both the right and the left testicle. And you notice that the right testicle is markedly heterogeneous on grayscale images. Now, when we add color Doppler, you can see that there's absolutely no intratesticular vascular flow. And given that the testis is heterogeneously hypoechoic, this is consistent with an infarcted non-viable testis. This testis will likely need to go on to orchiectomy. You do still want to compare with the contralateral testis, though. And you can see the left testis does have normal vascular flow. And again, no flow within that right testis. There is, however, peripheral curvilinear region of hyperemia within the scrotal wall. And that's an inflammatory reaction you sometimes see in the soft tissue in the setting of prolonged torsion with an infarcted testis. So this is typical for late testicular torsion. With early torsion, though, you often will have no grayscale changes and just loss of vascular flow. And those patients need to be emergently treated because the testis can be salvaged. Now here's a different example of a flow abnormality. Um, this is a color Doppler image showing marked hyperemia within the epididymal body. 
and also in the adjacent scrotal wall. And this is classic for acute uh, bacterial epididymitis. So this is caused by a retrograde spread of organism from either the urethra or the prostate. And the infection usually spreads from the tail of the epididymis to the body and the head. And the typical finding is on ultrasound, the epididymis will be enlarged, hyperemic, and then become dark, hypoechoic, due to edema. And usually that hyperemia will precede any grayscale changes. Now let's look at the rest of the scrotum in this case. So again, you can see that the epididymis and scrotal wall are hyperemic. And that scrotal wall is also quite thickened asymmetrically. Note also the right testis is heterogeneously hypoechoic. Here's another image showing that. And there's a hydrocele on the right, which is just uh, fluid in the scrotum. And in this case, it's simple, anechoic. So whenever you have a heterogeneously hypoechoic testis, you want to make sure that there isn't torsion going on. So we had color Doppler flow, and there's quite the opposite. You have intense hyperemia. So not only does this patient have epididymitis, but they have orchitis as well. So this is an example of epididymal orchitis, also bacterial. So the majority of epididymitis cases occur in isolation, but 20% of the time you can have associated orchitis. And on the other hand, orchitis usually occurs secondary to epididymitis. One exception to that rule is mumps. Patients with mumps, usually younger patients, can have isolated orchitis. And the findings of uh, orchitis on ultrasound will be similar to epididymitis, where the testicle will be enlarged, hypoechoic, and hyperemic. And it's important if you have a patient with isolated orchitis that's older than 60 to ensure follow-up because testicular lymphoma can mimic orchitis. It can cause testicular enlargement, be hypoechoic, and even somewhat hyperemic. This is a different case, a 51-year-old male patient with a hypoechoic testis. But instead of diffuse involvement, we have a well-circumscribed hypoechoic mass on sagittal images and then also transverse. So whenever you have a hypoechoic testicular mass, you want to add color Doppler imaging. And here we do have extensive intralesional vascular flow. That excludes the possibility of abscess, uh, subacute hematoma, or infarct, and is highly suspicious for neoplasm. And indeed, this was a seminomatous germ cell neoplasm. So germ cell neoplasms are the vast majority of testicular neoplasms, about 95%. And the most common pure subtype, meaning a tumor with only one histologic subtype, is seminoma. And the ultrasound findings vary, but they are typically homogeneously hypoechoic, well-defined, and don't tend to have calcification or cystic areas. Now, compare that to this case. This is a younger patient, a 24-year-old male, with a very heterogeneous, ill-defined mass in the testicle of mixed echogenicity and with some areas of central uh, and a coexistic change, a very heterogeneous mass. This is typical for a non-seminomatous germ cell tumor. And these tumors tend to be mixed uh, cell types, more than one cell type. So unlike seminoma, which is a, a usually a single cell line, these tumors might have a mix of different uh, non-seminomatous malignancies, such as a mix of embryonal cell, teratoma, yolk sac. And the ultrasound findings are usually the opposite of seminoma, but can overlap. They tend to be heterogeneous, ill-defined, and calcification and cystic areas are more common. So those are the basic uh, categories of testicular tumor. Non-seminomatous occur in younger patients and tend to be more heterogeneous, whereas the pure seminomatous types tend to be more homogeneous and in older patients. All right, that's the end of parts one through three. Thanks for listening in to the end, and I hope you enjoyed the series. Uh, stay tuned for more from radiologisthq.com.